All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by James Beck, who is just up the coast in Redondo Beach in the LA area. How are you doing, James? Doing great. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And, uh, and James, uh, so you have a very interesting background and, and, and story in, in terms of the fact that you, uh, in order to overcome P PTSD and anxiety from childhood trauma, you developed a way to use for serving other people and you, you tested your neuroplastic proactive mental rewiring theory in a nationwide year long experiment. And what you did was you literally gave away everything and you decided to go on a journey where you went to every, you know, 50 states and served at least one person in that state. Um, so what was, how did you come to, in the first place, how did you come to that point? And then we'll talk about servant leadership in general, but how did you come to that point of saying, this is what I need to do, service is where I need to be in order to, you know, have a fulfilled life? It was a moment of simplicity when I realized that, you know, looking at life and realizing that my father created my connection to the outside world and, and really kind of analyzing that and realizing it was true and like, Oh my gosh, I got to change this. <laughs> and, and I, and, and kind of seeing the path that uh, kind of my lineage. And I wrote a book on breaking patterns of generational dysfunction called Hey Dad, Remember Me. And, um, I finished writing the book and I thought, am I legit or am I a fraud? Do I really know how to break patterns of generational dysfunction or am I just, you know, brilliant in the bedroom? And so my mother was a, a nurse, a head charge nurse for a, uh, a neurology clinic. And I grew up in a foster home. So I have about 38 foster sisters, 11 foster brothers. Wow. And it was the last, it was called last chance foster home because right. it, it was the last chance and you're out in the street and you know half of my siblings uh, had uh, some sort of mental disorder split personality bipolar and so I grew up kind of understanding that dysfunction and then when you know things happen to you when you grow up in that environment and and kind of the the PTSD and and anxiety and hell that that warps your mind when you're young and seeing that there's another life out there and seeing other people have it and thinking okay, it is worth everything in my existence to live in this fashion, to live in a place of love and connection and joy and without anxiety and having to manipulate everything. So I, I gave everything away. Um, and what that was, what that did is it triggered my, repti the reptilian brain, the fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's actually fight, fight, feed, vorticate. And there's also a forged friendship. There's a fifth one. And when you are in a stressful situation and you serve it wires your minds to those that you serve and your op it puts you on the highest level of uh, human connection and understanding it releases dopamine it opens all your neural pathways right. for higher learning and so when you serve it releases serotonin dopamine and oxytocin so pleasure happiness and social bonding it re literally releases the best highest self you can be and every single religious text tells us as human beings to do this and I thought, you know what, instead of like working my way up to service, mm -hmm. what if I just started there, <laughs> cut everything else out of my life, and then just we rewired everything from that point back and see what would happen. And everything fell into place for me. Yeah. Just um, just tell me about that mo a moment, because I think a lot of people would find it hard to relate to because we live in a a consumer culture, right? Like an accumulation culture. And, it, you know, it's all about getting more and more and more. So the idea of giving away, giving away everything, I mean, that would be trauma. That would be traumatic for most people. It, yeah, but that was the point. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's kind of like when you, um, when you're afraid of snakes, then they put a lot of snakes on you until eventually your mind snaps and you're no longer afraid of snakes. Mm -hmm. When usually, you know, I was, I, like most people, was a very addicted to controlling my world, right. you know, money, you have labels, you have certain things that you build up. But when you realize that you've climbed the wrong mountain and you've put your whole life into climbing that mountain and you're like, well, 
crap what am i supposed to do now like because you don't know which parts of who you are there shouldn't be or there were the survival mechanisms that were dysfunctions that right. brought you there so you kind of have to start back from ground zero anyway so um one of the things that when you rewire the the mind is you change your environment but when you in dealing with uh, rewiring from ptsd and then also rewiring at the same time with service. So I run around the country serving a different family in every state. Over, you know, 60% of the people were strangers. So, you know, some of the people were friends, you know, from different times in my life. But um, yeah, I wanted to rewire my brain by living in a constant state of giving. Just like when a person goes to rehab, it takes about right. six months. Uh, but I, instead of this, this reactive state, I wanted to be in a proactive state of, uh, and it basically it triggers your reptilian brain. The one thing that people don't realize is what brings something in yourself from your subconscious mind to your conscious mind, from your parietal lobe to your executive function is using your motor skills, using your neuronal system, using a, a neuronal impulse from your brain to your spinal cord, to your muscles, what, whatever it's your lips moving your arms right. we have to do the service so then doing it puts you in your executive function but then by living in a state of service then it rewires it to your limbic brain your intuition so you get more of a connection of like how we're supposed to be and so uh, that's fascinating and then so you have you have since that obviously worked with people organizations and that to really help uh with the concept of servant leadership. Um, obviously, the concept of leadership, you know, generally, I think people see it as, you know, the person at the top directing and leading and forging forward. Um, they don't tend to talk as much about the, the servant element or the service element of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, serving first, wanting to serve first and wanting to serve the most and trying to serve the most and, and getting a, an inner joy about serving the most that is the key to everything and not not doing it because you have to doing it because you and that was the key for me when i gave away everything i owned and went around the country was i scared did it scare me to death? yes i chewed up the inside of my cheeks and it was like i dropped down to 165 pounds terrified with people like oh that's so zen i'm like i'm trying to get there man i'm not there <laughs> Um, but, yeah. So how do you so did, so how do you help translate that to people in in leadership positions? Because I, I think I mean I even think the idea of service or servant leadership within a corporation is something that the people, as I said, struggle with because they don't really know where to start or how to manifest that. Well, first of all, that is actually one of the things that I teach. I'm beta testing uh, a program for with. Uh, I have five slots. I'm working with ASU's innovation team, uh, and then I have four extra slots that I'm filling with the beta test. But there's a way that you can leverage service. Like I said, it releases mm -hmm. serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin. Yep. So you can both engage new teams, you can en enliven and optimize old teams. And then at the same time, you can heal um, teams that have just experienced a toxic environment from a, a leader that was or a person that was inappropriate or or mean or what, whatever they did to damage but with service it's this it's what the military the reason why the military can take a human life mm -hmm. and still hold their head high in honor why it's because it's service to their country so there's a level of uh you know everything is product and service but how does it work with the human mind the way you do it and the way that I, I, I teach it, but it's, it, you know, the thing is, is anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. but what do you, what do you focus on? And the key is in Eckhart Tolle talks about the observational human to where, you know, whenever you're having some sort of anxiety or difficult situation, you know, breathing and observe those yep. emotions, it, you can take it into a step further that, you know, the highest form of religion, they talk about yogis and Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus, service yeah so if you serve and you're you're in that state to where you're you're giving your life in that state it, it kind of creates an observational human being in yourself so then when you're not no longer in that state of service and you're just living your own life you go from 
uh, juxtaposing both your highest self, which you learn from the state of service, and then also your fight or flight reptilian, your survival self, which you are by the, the world programs you. So you, you're able to make better decisions by sometimes you do have to be a good steward and take care of yourself, but sometimes yep. you do grow and that gives you the mindset to grow. Yeah, and it's something interesting that you just mentioned there is um, becoming an observational, you know, human being. And I just think that that's a, in the culture we live in today, it's, it's people don't take a step back and observe. They, they're, they're always in things or things are happening or they're distracted. And actually becoming more observational, I think, is something that everybody needs to work on because we've, I think we've lost that art. I think, you know, instead of so much uh, an attention deficit disorder, it's more of an intention deficit disorder. There's right. a lack of intention. Even with the food we eat, the, the time we spend, the, we're going through life and worrying about things that in a lot of times don't really matter and then overseeing things that truly do matter. So how do you, how do you take that step back to where your, the, your partner, your spouse is, is happy with your commitment and your marriage, your partnership, whatever, you know, your kids are happy, your, you, if you have them and your relationships, your friends, your job, you know, things are moving forward. But like, if you don't take the time to self evaluate and, and realize maybe the times where I was, you know, and the worst thing for me is climbing the wrong mountain. Mm. I was successful. I won. That was my problem is I got to the top and I'm like, oh no, this, this is what I was working for. I was a managing partner of a post-surgical recovery facility in Beverly Hills. I worked with all the top plastic orthopedic and right. graduate surgeons. I was uh, also the um, manual therapist for NBC's The Biggest Loser. So I, I currently with a, a I've I've gotten into where I've done more public speaking and workshops on teaching how to transform corporate cultures into a cooperative community by using service. And that's at you know giveback.com. But before then, I created continuing education for osteopaths, chiropractors, continuing uh, PTs, massage therapists, and just advanced protocols. I worked for the biggest loser, American mm -hmm. gladiators, the medical teams, teaching self-care, like working on how to, you know, push the envelope and balancing the body, work professional athletes. So that's my background. So balancing the body, balancing the mind, balancing the spirit, um, but kind of connecting it back to the beginning. You know, I was kind of figuring out with my family, my foster sisters, I knew what crude touch, how much damage that does to a human being. So I was wondering how far could good touch, you know, kind of reset the human body, reset the psyche, you know, where are the limits on that? Just because, you know, I, I had to, su I suffered with that myself. I was figuring out that myself. And then once I figured out how to reset back to neutral, like how do you push forward? And then what could be a path that others could take? And that was the critical point is when I realized that all the things in my life were about me. And if I truly knew how to rewire the human mind and remove PTSD anxiety and can give that to other people and do it in a way that was what free. Right. And it helped everyone. And then I'm like, Oh, but it's what all it, all it's going to cost me is everything. Oh. <laughs> That's it. You know, it's like, and do you believe, or are you just crazy? Cause then I had to think, am I nuts? Right? Cause anyone could do this, but I have to. Mm -hmm. So then anyway, I did it. And now I teach, uh, yeah, I consult the, you know, March Air Force Base. So I was helping the California National Guard address the uh, suicide uh, epidemic and with their soldiers. I also work with uh, SJCOE, the San Joaquin Valley of Office of Education, with their at-risk youth and uh, leadership and um, the homeless leadership and veterans, um, you know, just how to stir hope with people that are suicidal. So been able to like use what all those things that were taught how to serve, but kind of like for me, what it was is like, I started at a very like helping extremely dysfunctional people, but not everyone needs that level. Yeah. yeah. So I kind of like with the, with what I consult with, I kind of have like the repatterning, which is 
if it's at risk youth or suicidal people with soldiers with things that are extremely sure. which is a different level couple mm -hmm. extra same material a couple extra things um and then there's rewiring which is just human capital optimization how do you optimize get a group to work together better and and because there's also trauma that kind of correlates that every company faces and what they don't really realize is that people die yeah. spouses die kids die parents die um, marriages end you know and you have tragedies that happen and so you have key people that are going through life and then boom they get hit how are you going to prepare and how do you what do you have in place for, with your human capital to get things going to where you know what the ROI investment on those people are and how many days a week and what that looks like going down the road moving forward and you're not just getting off the high horse executive uh you know and saying oh by the way i've never talked to you but i heard something <laughs> bad happen and by the way it sucks uh, you know somehow yeah. come back and make money for us one day soon. <laughs> like that's kind of like what they're at or even with this with the senior with the military leadership you know but like if you can look at a history of service and connection and then connect the people with they already have the relationships with a little more time then they you they can pour into that then those people and those relationships can move forward and then you have people that are more loyal to you and give more time and energy and love to fulfill your mission because you poured back into their heart. And that's kind of how servant leadership works. Yeah. And and I guess, I mean, at the, at the root of all of that is there has to be some, I mean, there has to be authenticity, but you probably have to do a little bit of self-reflection yourself before you embark on this, because to your point, because otherwise you could come off um, a little bit strange. You do. And one of the things that's really nice is when you do film yourself when you do have that observational element and that's one of the great things that's happened in culture is because we're all realizing that we can be filmed and we are being filmed and then but when we actually press the record record button we kind of are on our best behavior and we kind of look at who our highest self is because if you put like 10 grand in the corner <laughs> and you tell someone hey i'm gonna leave the room well it's a huge test of character whether they take it or not but if you tell them, hey, by the way, I'm going to leave the room and there's a camera in the corner. It's going to record and tell everyone in the world what you do. They're going to be like, oh, look at me sit in this corner and watch me guard this 10 grand and look like <laughs> a good person. So like kind of like bringing the letting the best out in yourself and in other people and kind of observing that. But then saying, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll run with this. Maybe, what if I'm the type of guy that just does this when no one's looking? What who would that then become in me and then exploring that and not having that change your life yeah no i think that's such a fascinating point there um about us being uh yeah, showing up as our best part as our best self because we know we're on camera and i guess the we have to change all those old adages now it's like uh how it's like you should act like you're on camera <laughs> instead of like how do you act when you know nobody's around like how do you act when there's no camera <laughs> yeah and you know what you know what's crazy is that Dudes still have not learned to like keep things zipped up on camera, like politicians, reporters. I mean, you're just like, really? Yeah. Still, dude? You didn't know still like keeping, but when you keep your, your mind in service, like how can I be of greater service in this moment mm -hmm. all the time? It allows so you're not you're not self deluding yourself to where you think you are bigger than the moment and then get stuck into some situation that embarrasses yourself. But, yeah, no, no, I think that, I think that's a, it's a great point. And uh, I mean, I think, uh, you know, a lot of people could take away from that and just the whole idea of, yeah, if, if you get more into service and away from what some person termed, and I think it's a great term of recreational anger, which seems to be what a lot of people have taken up as a hobby over the last number of years. It's how can I, you know, in my spare time, how can I be as angry as possible online and shouting on I, social media? Well, and that's the thing is that it, it's, we get addicted to that feeling of, of uh, the angst and the, uh, and, and it's easy to do it when you're a keyboard warrior. Mm -hmm. However, really, you know, what good is it doing in the world? No. What good is the time you're doing? And, and really evaluating it and not judging it, but like, how could I better use my time? What could, how could I better make my life 
existence better. And I, it really, it, it really comes down to service. And, and, and when you live a life of it, it transforms everything. Like, for example, yesterday, yesterday I had an interview and I didn't even tell my wife about it because it seemed like a small thing, but it turned into a big thing. It was a guy that's doing research for a book. How did I get it? Well, like in 2003, there's a girl that moved to LA who I ended up was friend. I was her first friend and I ended up buying groceries for her. And he fell in love with her a long time ago. And, and, and then I was the guy that helped her well then he had to befriend me to date her fast forward 18 years he's funding this research uh, research on service and transformation and he knows that that was real why because i i helped the love of his life and then i helped him with something and so when it came around it was like a no-brainer mm. when everything else had to, but when you live a life of service then the authenticity like you can't fake 20 years ago you can't no. fake 10 years ago and that's, and that's the beauty of what, what I think all servant leaders have in common is when you are putting that out, when you're trying to serve and you're really not trying to get anything for yourself, you're like, how do I make your life better? Why? Because I know everything's going to be better for everyone. And you're like, oh, that's selfish. It's going to be better for you. No, it's going to be better for everyone. Yeah. Like, and so like how some people are so such such cynics that you, you give them a Cadillac and you're like, that's, you're giving me such a gas guzzler. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. What's the catch? But, but being able to, I, and I think one of the things that's unique about what I've done is giving everything away, uh, living in a state of service, subjugating myself to different races and religions and ethnicities and, and socioeconomic statuses to kind of like understand what the human experience is like. So then now I can actually communicate like, okay, this is what service is. I have some, I have a voice to speak about because I've had this experience, I've had this repatterning of the mind. And then also like, not only that, well, I, I took a year to do that. And then afterwards it was funny because I was like, hey, wait a second. I can't let all the Mormons beat me in the <laughs> second year because they all do two years of service. Oh, wow. And, and, um, and, and the, the second year, it was uh, more Seattle, Miami, New York. It was like figuring out certain things with technology and stuff. Right. But it wasn't, it wasn't a structured one family in every state. But, you know, it was uh, rewiring the mind with service. How do you become a person that isn't suffering PTSD and anxiety? But I've had... Uh, I had a British, uh, British uh, Special Forces soldier come over from the Far East. He, he was emailing me. So he's like, are you serious? Are you, you know, for real? Because when mm -hmm. I worked in plastic surgery, he did, had a nose job because he got his nose punched with, in a bar fight. <laughs> I was like, hey, I understand that. I, mm -hmm. I'd want to breathe too. And I'm <laughs> talk, talking to people. Anyway, uh, so we were friends anyway. And I was like, yeah, man, this is real. And he came over, spent six months with me and, you know, rewired his mind he had P severe ptsd worked with other soldiers and i've worked with several people um uh you know it, it's had to talk guns out of people's mouths right but the reason why it's not that in one sense big of a deal I and mean, it's a big deal it's a significant deal but i grew up with foster siblings which like that was literally my whole childhood mm, yeah. so so it's like, yeah, it's a big deal, but it's kind of like, welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but you know, and that's, that's the, I, I guess the gift in, in, in the, at the end of the day that when you create uh, a purpose to your pain, it removes the victimization of your pain and it allows you to give a beautiful gift to humanity. And then it, it makes it to where it's then becomes a beautiful thing instead of something full of shame, it's something full of joy. Yeah, no, this is that's fantastic. What a great way to to end. And I just think uh, if if more people adopted a service mentality, obviously, I think the world would be a better place um, and maybe lift us out of our self absorption a little bit more. Um, listen, James, this is great. All of James's information is going to be below this um, video. But before we go, please just do tell people a little bit more about give back. Uh, give back. We teach people how to transform their culture, their corporate culture into a cooperative community. And we have three different levels to do that, how to 
enhance culture, optimize it, and then also heal it if you need it. But go to giveback.com and uh, enjoy seeing you out there. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, thanks again. And I would uh, encourage you to go check out the website and uh, check out all the different uh, constituencies that James has helped and is helping. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, this is a fa fascinating person, obviously, so you can book him to speak to. All right, listen, thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.